I don't know if this is really happening. A man, me, who's worth over $20 billion is now being, <laughs> being chased by CIA assassins. And in the middle of a robot uprising, <laughs> and I'm carrying what is in essence a tactical nuke. <laughs> The Transformers movies may have never exactly been setting the bar high in terms of quality, but the point where the franchise finally fully hit rock bottom was in its fourth installment, 2014's Transformers Age of Extinction. See, past criticism aside, I will say that the initial trilogy of films did pack some redeemable qualities that made them at least partially watchable, but Age of Extinction not so much. To put it simply, this movie is so unbearably hollow and boring and overall just so not so great that it manages to transcend even time itself. You sit there watching it for days on end and when it's finally over, you then realize that it's actually been only two and a half hours. And if I had to name one core source behind all that unbearable not so greatness, I would argue that source to be the one and only inventor of the three Bs, director Michael Bay. The thing about Michael Bay is that his career as a filmmaker very much parallels the Transformers franchise. His earlier movies weren't exactly cinematic masterpieces, but they did pack some redeemable qualities that made them at least watchable. But starting with Age of Extinction, every blockbuster he's made has been an unbearable sh show. And if there exists one specific Back to the Future-like cosmic turning point event where we lost Michael Bay for good, it's this movie right here. And that's what I want to focus on today. To use Age of Extinction as a case study in order to identify Michael Bay's core flaws as a filmmaker and how the growing success of this franchise made those flaws grow so strong that they ended up consuming him altogether. To be very clear though, all joking aside, the point here isn't to make fun of Michael Bay or whatever. I'm sure you can find plenty of stuff like that elsewhere. The point here is to recognize his main faults as a director so that maybe those faults can be fixed. Not that I think he's gonna be watching this because based on his Instagram, he clearly has better things to do. Hey, what I'm doing right now is I'm thinking about a wicked, wicked ass action scene. But it's just, you know, maybe if we put this in the universe, the universe will find a way to respond. I don't know. Also, speaking of, I have something serious of my own that I need to put in the universe and talk to you guys about as well, which is, um, well, it's a, you know what, we'll get to it later on. <clears throat> anyway, here are the main problems with Michael Bay as a filmmaker and how those problems manifest themselves in Age of Extinction. Here is how Transformers and Age of Extinction specifically ruined Michael Bay. Firstly, Michael Bay as a director wields this signature goofy superficial tone that in this movie has grown so strong that it's actually preventing us from establishing an emotional connection to it. The best exemplifying example of this is the case of our main Texas hero, Katie Yeager. Basically, Katie Yeager is a humble inventor who buys this big batch of old junk in a last ditch effort to make ends meet, because not only can't his daughter afford college, even his house is being taken from them. And I know it's been sucky around here lately, but we're gonna be fine, sweetie. You just gotta keep believing, okay? But then, Cage's life changes when the old rusty truck he bought turns out to be an injured Optimus Prime, who he chooses to help instead of selling out to the government for a reward, forming this incredibly strong bond between them to the point where they're both willing to sacrifice for each other when the other is at their most vulnerable. All of which, at face value, feels very powerful. Tell him to get away from my little girl now! Shoot her. That's only at face value though, because in reality, Michael Bay's excessively carefree goofy tone ensures that none of that actually feels like anything. First off, Kate isn't as much an inventor as he is a stereotypical mockumentary level parody of one. We don't see him invent anything that matters. We don't see him build anything that isn't a joke. Wait. So it just brings the beer near you? All we do see is that he has this absurd, super funny obsession of being an inventor. That I invented simply ahead of their time. Maybe something should never be invented? No, I don't. That's backwards thinking. I'm still gonna patent this. Look, I know you have a conscience because you're an inventor like me. I mean, that's what great inventors do. I promise you, one day, I'm gonna build something that matters. I'm an inventor. This could be a game changer for me. If I can apply that technology to my inventions, we never have to. 
And the reason why Kate doesn't need to invent anything is because even though this movie implies that he is struggling to make ends meet, Michael Bay's signature tone also makes sure that it's not actually a real problem for him or for us to actually worry about. That batch of old scrap Kate bought at the beginning, it's not like he ever tries to engineer it into something in a desperate final effort to make his investment turn a profit. It's just more unimportant junk laying around the house that he might or might not eventually get to. What is all this crap people send you? And as for losing the house, it's not really presented as a proper obstacle that could really happen, but instead more as just another joke. Sir, do you want to see the property? Sure. And I'll crack your head open like an egg. Hey, come back. Come I told you this. Oh, you smashed through the fence? And as for Kate's relationships, like with his daughter Tess, same thing. The main gist of their relationship is that Kate wants Tess to be a good girl who doesn't spend time with boys, but we don't go into it any further than that. This is a non-dating household, okay? You don't date, I don't date, that's, that's it. it. We don't dive into why Kate has developed a distaste for boys as a whole. We don't see Tess spend time with his boyfriend Shane and set up things like his car and the chase scene factory building before later on they all suddenly just appear. Basically, Kate hates boys just because that's what dads do, and because it's really funny then when he has to go on a journey with a boy who says he likes to bone his daughter. This is illegal. She's a minor. We're protected by the Romeo and Juliet laws. Statute 2705-3. And then finally, there's the bond with Optimus, which is never formed. We never see Cade work on a truck all night as his last remaining hope of making money. We never see him discover that it's a wounded Optimus Prime. We never get a moment where he really considers selling Optimus out to the government for a reward that can solve his problems but then chooses not to. It's not like he ever gives any of his own parts to fix Optimus. Instead, all of that is either just cut out or made into a joke or both. You guys have never seen a truck like this before. Get in here. It was a call, and if it ends up being alien, then you win $25,000. You don't win money. I've seen the commercial. They don't say that. That's not a guarantee. My Autobots can repair me. What about me? And so now that Optimus then reveals himself to save Kate's family, it feels like nothing, because Kate has done nothing to earn this action from him. When they go on this whole journey together as best friends, even though there was never a real friendship established between them, it's just pretty weird. And I know that's just one example, but if you watch the movie, you'll see that the same mentality applies throughout. Nothing feels like anything because everything is a joke. We have a crooked CEO who changes his ways for the good of humanity, but then still keeps saying stuff like... Get out of the way! Don't, just hit him, just hit him! We have a bold daredevil boyfriend who's willing to do anything for the love of his life, except for the times where he suddenly isn't. You ready? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whoa, okay, I surrender! I surrender! What'd you do? How'd you do that? I have no idea! Look, Michael Bay has always had this carefree tone in his movies in some form, yes. But in the past, it's been reserved enough that we could still at least on some level care about the world and the characters, like with Sam and the Autobots, for example. And I just wish that he would go back to that. His movies can be fun, but not everything in his movies has to be funny. Because if you lay down a proper emotional anchor and then just make that anchor into a joke, there's not much emotion to be found in it. But before we go on, guys, uh, I, I can't push this any further. I have to talk about this now because I, I need to ask you for help. So basically, in order to keep making these videos, I need Microsoft Office. And right now in the Krakosian store, it's $100 for a year, which is a bit more than I can afford at the moment because of something that's been going on in my life. So I was wondering if, if you guys could maybe PayPal me some money to... What? Wait, now I'm in the Indian region Microsoft Store and the price is much lower and I can actually afford it. And I'm also getting cheaper subscriptions, all kinds of cheaper deals online. What is going on? Who has saved my livelihood like this? Oh, guys, it must have been this magic blue bun. That bun being Surfshark, the almighty VPN that makes dreams like this come true. They're sponsoring this video with a special Black Friday offer of 83% off with four extra months for free by using code FILM. So if you want to find better deals online, if you want to protect your personal online data, if you want to see all the content that streaming services divide behind various GLUGs, check out the link in the description and get Surfshark's magic blue bun for yourself. It'll help out the channel as well. But anyway, yeah. That was about it. Okay, bye.
Secondly, as Michael Bay's clout as a director has grown, it's gone to the point where he does whatever he wants with plot and characters regardless of whether they fit together or altogether make any sense. The plot here, for example, is less one united motivation-driven story and more a bloated nonsensical mess of all these different stories and motivations so far apart from each other that they just end up cannibalizing each other. Essentially, the initial plotline is that after the Chicago War of the third movie, the government led by the CIA guy has begun hunting what remains of the Autobots to ensure that nothing like Chicago ever happens again. Which again, at face value, is not only comprehensible, but also pretty good. Our world will never truly be safe. Till all of them are gone. I'm trying to defend the nation from alien war. We've got a taste of what that looks like, and we are not going to tolerate it. Just to think of all the American lives we're going to save. The war will be over. But the further we go, the less comprehensible this plotline and the motivations driving it become. Because despite all the CIA guys talk about saving human lives and winning wars, the movie never establishes that there is or will ever be a war. And that's because the screen time is now being spent on the second plotline where we have this intergalactic bounty hunter transformer lockdown working with the CIA guy to capture Optimus Prime. In other words, we have a guy hunting transformers because he doesn't trust them, trusting a transformer enough to hunt with them. We have a guy with a motivation of finding Optimus Prime to save human lives, in reality trying to find Optimus Prime just so that he can hand him over to another Transformer. Which fits together about as well as water and fire that fell down to Earth from space. Also, did I mention that we have an intergalactic bounty hunter Transformer for some reason working with the CIA? What is that? That's my asset. <laughs> <laughs> well, the reason Lockdown is here to capture Optimus Prime is because their intergalactic creators are pissed that Optimus's fights on Earth have been tipping off the universe's balance. All this species mixing with species. It upsets the cosmic balance. The creators, they don't like it. Which is totally understandable and could very well work. Until suddenly it turns out that Lockdown is paying the CIA guy with this bomb that turns all material into transformer metal. And then it's like, so the creators have an issue with Optimus interacting with humans because it tips the scales of cosmic balance, but at the same time don't see any problem at all with giving humans what essentially is a transformer nuke. Okay? Well, the reason Lockdown gives humans the nuke is because we also have this evil company plotline where this questionable CEO is gathering transformer metal which they can use to build anything. We can change anything into anything. Except, of course, for the times that they can't. Why does he keep looking like Megatron? Why we can can't we make anything what we want to make? the way we want to make it! Again, this plotline of murdering Transformers to use their metal to build anything for huge profits could work great, until we then see that all they're actually building from the Transformer metal is just more Transformers, without any established reasoning as to why they're doing that or why they need a Transformer army when there is no battle for them to fight with that army and so on and so on. But it doesn't matter anyway because the only reason that happens is that we also have a plotline of Megatron being reborn with a new form and taking over that Transformer Transformer army to attack the Earth in the third act. So what I'm getting at is that Michael Bay's obsession of doing everything just results in this incomprehensible mess of incompatible plotlines fighting and sabotaging each other for any bit of extra screen time. There's a great quote by the writer of these movies where he basically says about the process that first Michael Bay comes up with all this cool shit he wants to do and then it's the writer's job to cram all that cool shit into one story, whether it makes any sense or not. And it's the same with characters. Michael Bay doesn't worry too much about what the cores of his characters are and instead will just make them do whatever he feels like even if it means destroying that core. We have these new Autobots intended to be different in both looks and personality who all just end up being the exact same classic Michael Bay character, the rash moron. So who's the stowaways? Oh, hey, what it's a hype. Cut the crap before I drop a grenade down your throat. Let's try to use violence as a last resort. And this comes with the cost of all these characters being ruined, like happens with Bumblebee. Bumblebee used to have a pretty clear personality before, but here he has suddenly turned into this Chad-like hothead who picks a fight with a model of a Transformer just because a voice on a television says that model is better than him. As if this reality actually took place on Xbox Live. Design was decrepit and let's face it, antique. <laughs> 
And I just wish that Michael Bay would find someone who dares to stand up to him and say no. No, we can't sacrifice basic story logic so that you can do everything you want. No, we can't ruin our characters just because you feel like they should act differently than who they are. No, Michael Bay, you can't just take movies from three separate MCU faces and cram them into one. The third core issue with Michael Bay of today is that he's gone to the point as a filmmaker where he genuinely does not care what you think about his movies, which carries a multitude of very destructive issues. The best exemplification of this here being the third act, where we suddenly go to China. Right away, the very obvious thing to point out is that we suddenly go to China. All of a sudden, the movie is being literally driven forward by these amazing superior Chinese heroes. Come, okay, Come. yes, I'll follow you anywhere. You're amazing. Even to the point where total random strangers in elevators fight our bad guys for us because that's just how Chinese people are, I guess. And altogether, this film becomes just pure Chinese propaganda. <laughs> We gotta call the central government for help. The reason this happens is because they need Chinese money to fund this film to increase its Chinese box office potential, which isn't that unusual. But the reason it's so much worse than usual here is because Michael Bay doesn't even try to keep it organic to the movie. He'll go to China, he'll let China dictate how their people and government are portrayed, he'll let China walk right over the film if it means one more dollar to the budget and box office, which showcases the fact that Michael Bay has lost his integrity. Another thing that happens here is this all-out war against Megatron's new army, which happens not because it's been in any way built up to or tied to what we've done before, but mainly because the movie just decides that that's what's happening now. I sense the presence of Megatron. He infected it with his evil nasty chromosome. Name the body the snappy name of Galvatron, but that's just Megatron. Hey, KSI all this time. Manipulate him into going after the sea. And it's pretty clear to every person who knows anything about filmmaking that you can't just add in a brand new villain to serve as a momentary third act opponent. Michael Bay does know it too, but he just doesn't care. Doesn't matter how the explosions and the dinosaurs and the Bayhem come to be, it only matters that they're there. Which showcases the fact that Michael Bay has lost his enthusiasm. And altogether, the third act is full of these bigger and smaller moments highlighting the fact that Michael Bay has lost his passion for filmmaking as a whole. We have this moment where Cade goes to take cover behind an empty wall when... Yeah, suddenly a random person has magically appeared in the shot right beside him. And it's not some crew member accidentally in the background. It's not a coffee cup that you won't notice until you read about it on Twitter. No, this is a random person right in the middle of the shot. And any sensible director who looks at this would go, okay, we can't use this shot. But Michael Bay, he just doesn't care. Another thing, you know how the main goal of the third act is for heroes to drive the transformer bomb across this bridge and out of the city before Megatron gets it? Well, after all that is said and done, turns out that Optimus could fly this entire time because they need that to set up the sequel. Which just begs the question of why didn't Optimus just fly the bomb away in the first place? And again, we're not talking about some minor plot hole here. This is something that makes everything we just saw pointless and obsolete. Just because the care and attention was more on the next movie than the movie being made right now. We have bombs that inexplicably begin tracking location. We have heroes who stay behind to block a bridge even though there are no more threats left to block it from. We have bad guys who wanna kill our heroes for reasons nobody knows. But who the f cares anyway, right? Not Michael Bay. And look, yes, Michael Bay has always been a confident filmmaker. You know, name one other director who has shown multiple scenes of his own dogs boning on screen. But I think this is the point where it got out of control. He knows he's making trash. He has no aspirations to stop making trash. And he's not afraid to let us know that. The movies nowadays, that's the trouble. Sequels and remakes, bunch of crap. And again, I'm not saying this to be mean or whatever, because fact is, he is very successful. I'm saying this just with the hopes that maybe if Michael Bay learned some humility, if he learned to actually care about what people think about his movies and listen to feedback, maybe that would allow him to regain his lost passion and once more become an actual filmmaker like he in the past used to be. Maybe.
potentially, I don't know.